welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Josh, and I'm with the uh, tech support department for HiTech. And so today we're going to go over some uh, single beam hardware configuration. So if, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we can we can answer questions as we're going through. Um, Speak up just a little bit. Oh, yep, certainly. Sorry. So if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and uh, we can try and answer them as we're going through, or wait till after. Uh, but uh, I hope you enjoy. So, all right, single beam hardware configuration. So, for the hardware in single beam, frequently GPS and sonar are not located in the same horizontal position. Some, sometimes they are, and that's good, but if it's not, then we have to have a reference point to set offsets to for, for that difference in location. So going into the hardware setup, um, which let's see. So hardware, so preparation and hardware setup gets us to, oh, we can't see my screen, sorry. All right, so anyways, hard, uh, preparation in the high pack shell and the hardware setup would get you to this screen here and the, it would automatically be set to have a boat as a mobile and you can right click on, or sorry, you can go into um, the settings in that and you can change the name of your boat. So if you have multiple, um, if you have multiple uh, mobiles on there, you can know the different names of them. So it's not just mobile one, mobile two, mobile three. And so under each mobile, So this would be you know, your boat mobile one renamed as the, uh, the vessel. And so under each mobile, you'll have your hardware set up. Uh, typically in, in single beam, you'll have, you'll just have the one mobile with uh, your GPS and your sonar on it. And so in the hardware, you add the devices, You're always gonna have a GPS. NEMA, and then in this case here, there's a Odom single beam on there. For multi-beam, or for tow fish, you would use these check boxes to include those devices. For single beam, we don't use that. This is where you can rename your mobile, your boat. So pretty simple, just type it in there. So when you specify the device, the devices on your mobile, you're using a, a DLL in in this list here. So there's, like I said, you know, GPS, the NEMA mobile. It's going to be Pretty common one, and then whatever whatever other device, devices you have on there. So your single beam, you'd find the correct DLL mobile for that, and you would add it. Just click the add button, and it installs it into your hardware package. So you can see on the right hand side, there's the two devices. And then you can add a vessel shape. And this is done in the hardware as well. If you have a shape file of your vessel, you can navigate to it in the boat shape file, and you can bring it in. And then if you do not have one, you can use the boat shape editor, and you can create one and save it, and then come into the hardware, and you upload that file that you created. And then the devices, the device locations would be added to the vessel. So for single beam, it'd be, you want to put it in the center of the boat and uh, forward and starboard are positive, just like X and Y, grid would be positive. And you add the location of your devices on the mobile. 
with their offsets from that zero zero at the center. Okay, so each each mobile sorry, each device under the mobile is going to have different functions. You can see on the bottom left to record raw messages, position, depth, heading, speed, um, tide, record device specific messages, um, and synchronize with the computer clock. So your GPS would obviously have position, um, speed and, and heading if you have that capability. into HiPack, we have to, to talk to it. So you have either uh, serial or, or network. And so the device connection in the Survey Connect tab, you would choose what type of connection it has. You could change the baud rate. It, the baud rate would have to be, it has to be um, the same as, we, you have to tell it to look for the baud rate, rate that the device is, is putting out so that they can communicate properly. So you can see in, when you click the device connection tab, that device connection window comes up, serial port, com, speed. Then the device offsets tab, this is it's pretty simple. It's, so this is for the GPS device, and um, so it's just showing five units starboard, five units four, and vertical, um, you know, negative three and a half. So that's you have to get those accurate. And sometimes if something's not looking right or something's not coming in right, you go back, you measure your offsets, and make sure that those measurements are done correctly because that, that just a little bit off of the measurement can throw off a lot of things down the road and don't realize it until a little later. So it's an easy one to go back and double check your measurements and make sure everything's correct. And to always remember that positive four and positive starboard and positive down. So some, some example hardware configurations. This is showing down here the check boxes for uh, a tow fish and or for a high sweep survey to include those. Once again, it's a single beam, so right now it's likely to be used. And this is back to those device functions. So for each device, you have to specify the functions of the device. GPS messages, that's all that's going to be recorded in your raw data. And you don't want to have you don't want to have multiple things checked. Or the same thing checked on multiple devices. You know, you want to make sure you have your position device checked. That that's where you're getting your position from. Um, heading, speed, and so on. Yeah, I'm gonna All right, I'm going to jump in a second. I'm Jerry Nisley. I'm, I work with Josh in tech support. How many people understand what the functions are of your single beam sensors? How many people in here have a single beam? How many people in here have surveyed with a single beam? How many people have struggled with hardware? There's a couple times you get screwed up, things don't work, you're trying to troubleshoot stuff. And I'm just going to jump in and help out Josh for a second with some of the stuff on here. When you're looking at this, a lot of devices can have multiple functions. So how many people have an Odom echo sounder? It's a pretty common echo sounder. It has the ability to have position. 
because the odom echo sounder can actually pump the GPS in, you can bring the GPS into the odom and it can feed it to us through an Ethernet port. So sometimes you'll have a device driver, I think the odom actually has heave because you can bring in the heave compensator into it and we can read the heave from your sonar even though it's a separate sensor. So you're daisy chaining the heave sensor into the sonar sensor into your computer so you'll notice that there's a bunch of check boxes that you're not using all the time. Or you have a GPS that doesn't have heading. How many people have a single antenna GPS? Anyone have a dual antenna GPS? Dual antenna GPSs provide you with heading, right? Single antenna GPSs don't. In the GPS driver, you'll have a heading option, but you don't need to check it. If you're doing RTK GPS, how many people do RTK GPSs? There's a function in the GPS DLL that says there's tide and depth. Well, GPS is never a depth, right? Except when it is. That's the big joke. Once I went on a job and we were doing an RTK GPS of the next rater and they wanted to actually record depth of the antenna. They mounted the antenna on this big four inch diameter steel pipe that stuck out of the water and as they were digging they were using that four inch steel pipe like a level rod, like a rod. And we knew the tip of the pipe touched the bottom of the bucket so wherever the antenna was, subtract 20 feet and that's how deep they were digging. So we had to input depth as an option from our RTK corrections. So you're gonna notice that a lot of the drivers and things are gonna have a lot of different updates. Use for matrix update. Some of these will be grayed out, some won't. Use for matrix update means that you're gonna update the matrix with this sensor. If you blindly go through and just leave everything checked on all the drivers and just say, okay, I'm gonna go with everything checked. In the RTK scenario, I'm gonna record depth and tide from my GPS. Can anyone see where that would be a problem? What's going to happen if the GPS is the first sensor you added in hardware and then it was set as a depth and, and position and tied and then you added the Odom echo sounder or one of the other echo sounders that's out there and you go to process. When you go into single beam editor, the first thing that's going to happen is it's going to populate the echo sounder field with your GPS because it's a depth device. And then you're going to be trying to process it if you didn't catch it and it's going to say your GPS was your position and your depth and your tide which is really going to be funky. And then you're going to call up tech support and we're going to say, we don't know what's going on, you're crazy. Or we're going to figure out that, yeah, in reparameters, make sure you have the right echo sounder chosen. Yeah, GPS really wasn't an echo sounder, you just left it checked. How many people have multiple hardware configurations that you deal with? Like you change things out, you swap parts out. How many people have the same thing every time? Once you set your hardware up, it gets copied project to project to project. It never changes. Unless you physically change your offsets, all you have to do in hardware is go back in and check it out. Make sure it's right. Make sure everything's good. You don't have to go back in and out of hardware a lot. If you go from one project to another, your hardware is carried over. How many people have Halifax on your computer? Anyone know what Halifax project is? How many people delete the Halifax project? Because I'm going to scold you. First thing you do when you call us up and say survey doesn't run, we're going to say does it run in Halifax. The reason we ask you that is when you're troubleshooting something and you half split a problem, Halifax works. We design it to work. We put it on your computer because it's a way for you to learn something. The second thing it does is when something's wrong, it's either in your project or it's in our software. Right? So when you call my team up and you say, hey, I got a problem. The first thing we want to know is do I troubleshoot the project or do I troubleshoot the computer, the software? Is there a problem on my end? So if you take Halifax off, we can't do that. So please leave Halifax alone. So use for matrix update. I said you're going to update the matrix with it. The ones that are grayed out, you can't uncheck those. We used to let you turn off raw and quality of the GPS DLL. This is the GPS DLL we're looking at. Raw and quality. Raw is the raw WGS84 latitude and longitude. We record that into your file. We find that people sometimes screw up geodesy. How many people in here sat through the geodesy and RTK lesson? Anybody sit in that one? Geodesy is uber important in IPAC, right? It's the most important thing. You gotta make sure you're surveying in the right spot. So if you screwed up your geodesy, we need to translate it from the wrong geodesy to the right geodesy. Now we make you store the latitude and longitude. The quality data tells us what the quality information was of your GPS. That's important to us if we're trying to recalculate RTK tides. 
So some of these things you're not able to change or choose. So that's, I just wanted to go a little deeper into this with Josh for this part of the yeah, session. Thank you. Um, there's over 400 device interfaces in HiPack. Over 400 things in the world that somebody's made that we can interface to. And we've made it our policy to interface to everything we can. If you say, I got a widget. If it's a difficult widget, we're going to charge you to interface it. But if it's just a simple widget, we've probably got a generic parser that can read it, or we've done it in the past. Um, if there's ever a question, does my sensor communicate with HiPack, email help at HiPack or talk to somebody in tech support, they'll help you out. All right. Back in. So single beam uh, echo sounder placement, you know, perfect world. We could place it directly under the uh, the antenna for the G you know, GPS and transducer could be right above and below each other. Um, if, if we can do that, great. Um, it, it eliminates the possibility for a lot of errors. Um, okay, so in the hardware, Click options, WCOM32, it's a way to test serial connections and port settings. You could go in there and um, find out the speed of data coming in. Uh, so it's, a, it's an easy way to test it and, and make sure you're configuring it correctly. Okay. It'll tell you what, what ports you're receiving data on. connection. This is just the setup window for um, UDP requires, I, I, well UDP and TCP are both going to require an IP address. Uh, it may be necessary to reset the IP address uh, for your computer to address similar uh, to your network device. So it would be the first three sets of characters would be the same and then the last three sets of characters would have to be different. setup and test buttons. Located under the survey devices tab, they're used to configure a device dependent settings. Each device could be different. Some devices might not really have any setup. Once you've got, once you think you've got your devices set up, you can go to the test device box instead of going out into survey program and see if it's working. You can test the device and that will show you what data is coming in. So you do the test if there's nothing and you know something's wrong or if the data doesn't look right, you go back into your configuration right inside the same hardware windows and get that stuff sorted out. So GPS configuration. So recorded NEMA messages. The GGA, um, 1 to 10 hertz. Um, these are all the standard GPS messages coming in, you know, the, from GPS into HiPad. And so the hertz is the rate that those messages are getting sent. Um, some of them, you can, you can vary that rate. Uh, ZDA, 1 hertz only. That's used for uh, time synchronization. Uh, the VTG, one hertz, it's a speed course over ground. The HDT, your heading, uh, one hertz for single beam, 10 hertz for multi beam. Um, heading from directional antenna, if, if you have heading, if you have two antennas. Um, one hertz for the GSB and one hertz for the GST. So this down on the right, that's just showing the, that's for RTK, showing all the math and how that works. Um, all right, 
right, so synchronizing the timing. Um, if you're using a, a PPS box, one pulse per second, that's checking the timing at one pulse per second. Some devices will have a, a PPS box. I believe we actually sell one. Um, we, we have an external box that can be used. And it's, it gives more accuracy with, with, uh, with, the time, with checking the timing and latency. Um, so maximum recommended H dot value would be four. So this is for the GPS setup. These are all settings that you can put in there. If, it's, if your GPS is working within the parameters that you set, then, then it's working fine. But it will, setting this up, if it's working outside of these parameters, then it will give you a message and say, hey, something's going on. You wanted it to work within these parameters. It's not. So recommended H dot value, uh, maximum four. Uh, minimum number of satellites recommended would be five. And maximum sync error, uh, recommended 100. And then you can also have it just show an alarm, or it can actually suspend logging. So if you don't notice it right away, it's not collecting a bunch of data that, uh, that is outside the parameters that you've set. So, I think it's safe to assume most of us are probably using GPSs made after 2005, maybe maybe not. Um, but so anything after 2005 has the, the NEMA 3.0 standard, which would just have some different codes for the messages coming in. So this in the GPS setup, this just sets up what standard you want to use. So if you do have an older GPS, it would be speaking a slightly different language, so we'd want to tell HiPath that it's looking for that. So, um, still in the GPS setup, these used census sentences. These are all. This is. These are all the the codes we could be receiving from the GPS, and you don't necessarily need them all. What you do need would be GGA, HDT, uh, VTG, I think that would be the very minimum that you would want. So by only using the desired messages, it's just limiting the recorded the recorded data in in your raw files. Go back to that slide a second. The user modified NEMA messages a second ago. I was talking about the Odom. I'm not feeling well, so I apologize. This happened last year. It's happening again this year. Not doing well at the conference. Each one of the sonar manufacturers likes to bring the GPS into their sensor and pump their data through to us. So that's why we have those modified messages. If you just hook up the Odom or the C-Scope or any of the sensors to, let's say, I don't want to make anyone mad, Reese on Edge Tech, Kongsberg, any of those sonars, and you bring the GPS into it and then you connect to the GPS DLL, it's not going to work. And the reason is they say that they just pass through the GPS data to us, but they don't. Everyone puts their own little junk of header information on the, the line that they read it and they spit it back out with like a little time tag or they put their own little code in front of it. So we had to go through and add all these modified NEMA messages so that we could understand, well, the ping DSP puts this in the front and strap that off and use it like a GPS message. A lot of times single beam surveys are set up, your hardware set up, you configure it. If you go in and you start changing drivers around and changing the things around within your uh, configuration, I'm losing my thought for a second, but here's the problem. 
if you lose your hardware configuration, what I started to say, everything's set up and working and running functionally well on your computer, like I said before, you don't change it, right? You're doing a single beam, you're using the same equipment. Anyone ever have a project die on them? Or lose their hardware settings and you have to rebuild your hardware from scratch? There's two ways to recover it. In the hardware, there's a place where you can go into the archive directory and any changes you make to hardware get stored as an archived hardware setup. You can actually go in and import those settings back that came about because we got used to you guys calling us saying all my settings got wiped out, how do I get them back? And this is a simple single beam GPS kind of scenario, but imagine a dredge where some of the dredge pages have a hundred different tabs on them and slides and things you got to set up. So if you lose your hardware setup, what, I, what my train of thought was, a lot of times people will go back and say, yeah, I was using the GPS deal for the GPS, they'll forget about this modified section. So you have to remember to go back in there, and if you're using a specific sonar, you have to make sure you choose that specific header. If anybody has any questions on how to restore your archived har uh, hardware settings, I can show you that after. It's pretty simple. Okay, so for echo sounder setup. So, for a vertical offset, correct for static draft, either in the echo sounder or in the hardware. Do not want to do it in both places. So it's, you're, you're applying a vertical offset for the location of the echo sounder, and if you do it twice, it's it, you know, it, it's you're, you're doing it twice, so you're going to have incorrect offset. Um, so you can either outputting the depth below the transducer or depth below the surface. Um, so it's just something to be careful of. There's some redundancy in offsets. You don't want to apply any offsets twice. You just want to make sure you do it one time. So echo sounder configuration offsets. This is um, for the offsets for the GPS here and enter the offset of the echo sounder transducer relative to the boat origin. So the boat origin is going to be your, your zero zero in the center of the boat. Um, once again forward is positive and starboard is positive and Z is positive down. For most uh, single beam echo sounders, um, enter a latency of zero. Um, enter the combined latency between the GPS and the echo sounder determined in the single beam latency program as the latency for GPS device. <coughs> so depending on your echo sounder, um, Available functions will will differ. Um, as a minimum, you want to select depth. That's what we're using it for. Um, so you have options to use for matrix update. If you want to, if you create a matrix and you want to update that matrix with the echo sounder depths, then you would want to check the option to uh, use for a matrix update. And you want to uh, record, uh, let's see, record device specific messages that enables storage of acoustic data for certain sounders. So MRUs in HiPack, does anybody use an MRU with single beam? Back to the um, hardware configuration. This is showing the Trimble GPS and the Odom CV3 single beam. Okay, 
So back to the mobiles. The mobile first mobile will be your boat. You will have a mobile for each device you're tracking location. Does that sound right? It does. So I'm going to jump back a couple minutes. Yeah. So one of the things this year, we're getting more and more people given the training sessions, and I threw this one at Josh. The mobiles, one of the things I want you to understand about mobiles, every vehicle, and to us a vehicle, is a digging tool, a sensor that's being towed, or your boat. Each one of those would be something we want to track, right? We want to record that information. Those would be considered mobiles and hardware. So your boat, if you're on a single beam survey, you're just out there doing single beam, this is designed towards single beam, but it includes some of the more advanced hardware configurations you could get in. Single beam boat, you're going to have one mobile. You're just on your boat, driving around, right? If you're towing a side scan and you're towing a magnetometer, you're going to be in this area. Cutter suction dredge, you might have three mobiles. You could have a boat, which is a, the body of the dredge, with a cutter head, that the arm swinging out, and a spud. So the spud is the big toothpick that holds the dredge in place. Hopper dredges, you're going to have each one of the heads and the vessel is going to be a mobile. So you're going to have three mobiles. Mobiles are designed in high pack as vessels or vehicles. You can think of them as an independent position that I want to record or an independent vehicle that I want. We consider a mobile, so is what we, our term is. So there's different configurations for that. All right, jump to the next slide. So in here, you have a GPS and an echo sounder, which is a pretty simple, common configuration. GPS is over the cabin because it's easy to mount it on the cabin, and the echo sounder is hanging over the side because it's easy to mount it there. So on this particular boat, you're going to have one mobile, the GPS and the Odom Mark III. That's the one we chose to say we were using, right? So the boat is our only mobile. Base configuration. And we get into the situation where he was talking about the MRU being at the center of gravity. Anyone know how to measure the center of gravity of a boat? I don't either. I'm not a ship. <clears throat> Somebody told me once you hook up a bunch of straps and you can figure out where the center of gravity is, but all I would probably do in my world is crack the thing in half and cost my company a boat. So generally the middle of the boat, the midships, about at the water line is where the center of gravity of a lot of boats are. Um, how many people run a sea arc or similar type vessel? Inside the rear door on the floor is where I've seen everyone mount their MRUs. You don't have to be exactly the center of gravity measured with a crane that figured it out like, you know, um, there's a couple people at high pack that would actually try to figure it out and measure it and do all that. I would pick the center of the boat close to the water line. Once your MRU's in here, your GPS and your echo sounder would be over here. So, in the very beginning, Josh showed you guys about offsets, right? Offsets are very important. In this particular case, your MRU is going to be your zero, zero point. And the reason we put the MRU at the center of gravity when he was talking about reducing errors <coughs> is if your MRU is at the center of gravity and the boat rolls, MRU doesn't really go up or down much, right? The boat rolls and it measures roll. But if the MRU is out here on my arm and I go like this, do you know what that's called? Roll-induced heave. So if the MRU is not at the point that the boat rolls, you induce heave in your MRU as it rolls. Because the MRU is out here, and it senses that as the boat rolled, it dropped down half a foot. MRUs are really good at that. That's kind of why you buy one, right? So the whole point of having it at the center of gravity, you don't want roll-induced heave. That's the errors that Josh was referring to taking out. The better you can do your measurements, the less you're going to fight about your survey. Yes, sir. <laughs> Correct. So and you would offset to your MRU still? Yeah, so the MRU still is zero zero, but it's gonna be to the start. In this particular case, let's assume it was with our transducer. It's on our in this picture it would be on our port side aft. It's not where our GPS is. But if our if we had a co-located MRU with our sonar. Our GPS is way up here, and this is back here. I'd move the GPS first of all. Let's not be stupid about this. I would move the GPS. 
but if your MRU is located with your sonar head, they're designed so that they measure that heat, and you can do, in the software, we have the ability to reduce that heat. Um, I forget the option. Single so editor, anyone remember the one? There's a heat option. You check the box, and it averages heat over time, and RTK. I forget the option. There's a way to get rid of it. But as long as you're at lower, you would take your offsets from here and go back to your center of gravity and make the reference point the center of gravity of the boat, and then the MRU would calculate that lever arm. Those are the two ways to do it. Did I answer your question or make it more confusing? Okay. Anyone else have a question about that? Did I confuse anyone else with that? The co-located MRU with a sonar. If it's back here, you could offset both the sonar and the MRU to this location, and then the MRU is going to calculate the lever arm so that you don't get the roll-induced heave. It's going to calculate what the heave was back at the center of gravity, not at the sonar. Or within the software, you would eliminate the heave. There's a way to do that too. But in the top of my head, that's not what we're talking about, right? Good? Yep. Everyone good? All right, let's go to the next slide. So, configuring a mobile. So the first thing you want to do, you can open up high pack hardware, you have to know what you're surveying with. Am I using a single beam? Am I using a magnetometer? What am I working with? How many people in here work with anything they tow? Anyone tow magnetometer or any stuff like that? You guys are all single beam users? Nobody tows anything? Anybody work on a dredge? You got one guy back there, you tow stuff? All right, how many people work on a dredge? How much fun is it to configure a dredge? We all love dredges. I spent 20 years, I've been with IPAC 22 years, I spent 20 years at IPAC working on dredges. I've configured more dredges than I can possibly count. They're so much fun to configure. Before you start, you know what hardware offsets you're gonna, or what hardware sensors you're gonna have, and how many mobiles you're gonna have, right? It's a cutter suction dredge, you might have a spud, you're gonna have a lever arm, you're gonna have a barge. So the first thing you wanna do is, and go in and say, okay, do I have a, a mobile? Yeah, I want to add a mobile. You can give it a name. Now this is new in 2019, 2018 maybe, where you can rename boat. Before 2018, boat was always your first mobile. Mobile one, or mobile, we start at zero because we're a bunch of egghead programmers. So mobile zero is your first mobile. Now it's, we actually call it boat. And then the next mobile is mobile one, which is something else. And you could, you could rename Mobile One, but you could never rename Boat. Now you can actually rename the boat. So that RV Smokey down on one of the slides, you can rename it. Is it going to be fixed to another one? So some mobiles are referenced to a first mobile. If you're on a cutter suction dredge, your inclinometer references your barge. Anyone ever been on a cutter suction dredge? You know what they look like? It's a little platform with a big ladder in front of it and a drill bit on the end of it. That drill bit is the cutter head, and that's what our mobile is. Our mobile is the cutter head of that ladder. That's what we care about. Where do, were you digging? How deep were you digging? That is mobile two, or mobile one. Mobile one. So your boat, mobile one. So it's relative. It's a relative mobile. So you need to have it on the offsets tab. There's a check drop down box when you install the inclinometer driver it says, What is it relative to? Where do I get my starting point? Because all that driver does and say wherever my starting point is, my ladder was this long and my depth is that, so I'm here, right? It doesn't know anything about GPS coordinates or anything else, it's just a strict offset from your starting point. Your starting point would be your bolt position. So it's fixed, jet offset DLL is gonna give me the position. So if you're on a barge, how many people know what a spud is? Everybody's hand should have gone up. I said it was the big toothpick that holds the barge in place, right? The big toothpick on the back is those big steel things that they drive down in the ground to keep their, their dredge in position. So if I want to know where the spud is on the back of my cutter suction dredge, and I don't have a GPS on it, I'm going to make a mobile. I'm going to come down through this list and say, yep, I want a mobile. It's fixed in relation to my barge. I'm going to use the jet offset DLL. I'm going to put the offsets back to that spud. That's where I want to know where the location is. So anywhere that my barge goes, it's going to give me a fictitious calculated position of where that spud is. Anyone know why that's important? And this is actually a very serious and real consequence. Utilities? Yeah. 
I've seen multiple instances, not with me on board, but pictures or been informed of people driving those into gas pipelines or dredging into a gas pipeline and blowing up things. And people die from that stuff. It's a very serious world consequence. So if you're working around pipelines, you want to know where your spuds are. Like I said, they're a big steel toothpick and it's got a pointy end on it and you go over a 24 inch pipe, it's probably going to puncture it. So you want to know where it's at. Gen offset DLL is a good way of knowing where those sharp objects <coughs> on my dredge are. Toefish DLL, trackman and inclinometer. Inclinometer would be for cutter suction dredge. Toefish and trackman or if you're towing something. Trackman would be more if you're using a USBL system. Anyone know what a USBL system is? USBL systems, it's a series of hydrophones on board. It's a, a head. And if you put a diver in the water, and they got a little beacon on their back, and it goes ping, 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 right? And the diver swings around, and the USBL system tells you where he is. And he doesn't have to be tethered to the vessel. You can actually see him. Anyone know what an ROV is? We've all watched Discovery Channel one time in our life, or been bored enough to know what an <coughs> ROV is. They drive around underwater with the cameras on them, and they take great videos and pictures of stuff. And shipwrecks shows all have them. If you're tracking an ROV, you're using a USBL system because it gives you, you have a GPS above the water telling you where you are, you have a USBL system that's tracking where that ROV is, and then in high pack in the 3D, the 3D TV program, we can actually show you that ROV on a multi-beam surface and you'll know where you're flying around in the water. Right. Magnet DLL, that's a whole different thing. It says adding a towfish mobile, and there's only one mobile there. Some of these slides don't make a lot of sense. That was my mistake. This is one of mine. In survey. So when you're in survey and you're looking at mobiles in survey, what do they look like? Anyone know? They look like your boat, because it's just another boat, unless you assign it a boat shape. So in survey, this is a towfish towing a magnetometer. Towfish driver says we have 50 feet of cable out. Here's a cantonary factor that we calculated at 0.9, which gives us a layback somewhere on the display that I can't see. Total cable out is 50. I can't read layback, it should be right there. But then, here's my boat with my little ectus circle and arrows, and there's my towfish, and that's the towfish cable. <coughs> I was going to sit down and let you take this one, but I'm going to stay up here for just one more second. All right. Do you mind? I don't mind as long as you feel it. Anyone else mind? All right, just checking. We've got to make this fun, guys. Come on. We're here for three days. <laughs> I feel like hell. But timing, the only reason I wanted to jump into timing is timing is very critical. What's the single most important thing you can do in your survey? Anyone know? Timing. And here's why. Anyone know what latency is? How many people understand latency? Latency is the amount of time it took to take a position and to take a sounding and get him into my computer. Right? <coughs> so let's assume time zero. I impossibly had a GPS fix exactly when my sonar fired and they both get back to the computer at different times. Do you know why? The GPS took time to process the signal. The sonar took time to process the signal. They both came over different ports, they came different ways. It takes a little bit, there's timing difference, right? It could be milliseconds. It's a consistent number of milliseconds between how they process. So latency is something you have to account for. How many people use Ethernet-based GPS data? Latency is almost nil nowadays, right guys? How many people have done a latency check on their single beam boat in the last year? Okay. How many people think they should have? Do you know what latency will look like in your survey? How many people survey cross channels? You go back and forth across the channel. How many people have had a seesaw pattern on the edge of the channel? Either large or small. That's what you get. It looks like a sawtooth. You're pushing or pulling your data. So when you're surveying this way, your latency's pulling your data. 
So the, the, pier, the points are going to go that way when you do a contour. When I go that way, they're going to go that way. So you're going to get a seesaw pattern right on the edge of your channel. <coughs> if you see a seesaw pattern in contours and single, it makes 100% latency. And it's very simple to solve. You just run two lines across an object or across the channel, opposite directions at the same speed, and then you run a little program, and it tells you how to fix the time to make it line up. Latency can also be a, the latency program can also fix a pitch error if you're having a pitch error on your boat in a single bit. All right. To handle timing, HiPack uses a thing called the Veritime clock. The Veritime clock runs in the background. It's HiPack's method of counting clock ticks. Your computer clock is not very accurate. It's just the way it is. It's more accurate than your watch, but it's not as accurate as it should be. So we run a separate clock and we do a sync with your GPS time tags, normal mode, devices receive their time tags from the Veritime clock model, and that's how it works. Everything gets time tagged to ourselves. If you sync the computer to your GPS time, everything gets from the Veritime model that GPS time. How many people bring uh, PPS pulse into anything? How many people use a PPS box? Anyone ever seen one? Do you know what a PPS box is? Anyone ever heard of one? Do you have one? No? Okay. A PPS box is a one pulse per second device. A PPS box provides, it receives from your GPS or whatever sensor is providing your timing source, a one pulse per second, usually about a five volt, one millisecond spike. It's consistently once a second. They do it through a very high rated capacitor it fires that spike exactly once a second apart. Do you know why? What did I just tell you? Your computer time's not that accurate, right? A PPS time is very accurate. So, the GPS outputs time. Does anyone know what the, the message for time for GPS is? is? ZDA. So your ZDA message is what you need for time. The GPS outputs time along the ZDA message, and then it takes that pulse and it says, I got a pulse, and you told me my ZDA time was this. That matches up. So then the computer can say, at the time of that pulse, my time in my computer was time whatever, umpty squat. But the ZDA time was offset by 7 milliseconds. So I want to shift everything 7 milliseconds to line everything up. The next pulse comes in, and it was off by 3 milliseconds for what the computer time was. It was a slower, smaller drift, because computers are busy, right? They got stuff going on. The PPS pulse keeps everything in sync. <coughs> How many people have been on a multi-beam boat? If you think timing is important in what we're talking about right now, on a multi-beam boat, you can't survey without time. Time has to be exact, right? It has to be precise. You have to, the PPS pulse goes into the multi-beam the time of the GPS goes into the multibeam to time the multibeam. We accept that the multibeam has the correct time because we don't have any way to verify it. You have to put that in. If you go to any of the sonar manufacturers, you have to give them PPS and GPS time or else their data is not valid anyway because it needs that information. It has to have it. Time is critical. Did I beat that horse to death? Everyone understand what's the most important thing you can do? You know what the second most important thing you can do? Geodesy. Make sure your geodesy is right. All right. Move on. Do you want this one or you want me to look at that one? Like that one? Yeah. This is what I was talking about with yeah, latency. When I talk about latency, the measurement time was here. This is when the first character got to the computer. That 0.2 seconds would be a huge latency nowadays with any modern equipment. 0.2 was pretty common when I first got around at high back and started doing this. You'd have 0.1, 0.2 seconds of latency. Nowadays, if you have 0.1 second of latency, something's seriously wrong. A lot of the equipment's a lot better. The computers have gotten better and faster. I'm going to sit back down and let Josh take back over. I apologize for jumping in a couple times, but I just want to make sure I help out. All right, so this is, this is just showing the theory of latency that Jerry just explained. Uh, he, 
you mentioned about going over a slope or an object um, and, and different directions and measuring that latency. So this is all for latency tests. We're seeing we run reciprocal survey lines up or down a slope over a known feature. It's best if your plan lines are perpendicular to the bottom slope. <coughs> if latency correction is perfect, the profiles will overlay each other. If there's an error, the profiles will be early or late. And the latency test program varies the time takes to determine the best latency time. So to do that, what, the three, three tests to, to Before you it, change it, do three tests. Yeah, before you change it, do three tests to take an average of the three. One of the things that he's asking about is you never do it. If you did a latency test and everything was great, you always had 0.2. And you do a latency test and all of a sudden it's 0.6. Do another latency test. You've got something wrong with your survey data. It only works with raw data. It doesn't work with edited data. So you can't filter out spikes. Maybe you got a spike in the data. So once again, run perpendicular to the bottom slope. Running non -per perpendicular to the slope will generate errors um, unless the reciprocal track lines are dead on with each other, which is not easiest to do. <coughs> Also, jumps in position due to poor uh, GPS positioning uh, can result in false latency results. So run the latency test three times, each time with a separate pair of lines, and use the average latency time. Results are more easily repeated with RTK GPS than with DGP. So this is uh, the latency test program under utilities calibration menu. The top is before uh, any correction is added. And you can see it's more evident on the slopes. And then you can see with the correction, you, you, you get a lot of that air out of there. So latency test computes a combined value between the GPS and the echo software. In the hardware program for the GPS device, take the currency latent time for the GPS, subtracts the result of the average three latency tests, um, set the latency time on your GPS to 0.25, so it's, uh, for this hypothetical test, it's, uh, our latency time for the GPS was 1 minus uh, 0.72 or 0.75 equals uh, GPS to, uh, to a quarter, uh, 0.25 for your latency correction. <coughs> Make sure the latency time of your echo sounder is set to zero. Go back to survey, collect three more sets of test lines and check the results. If you're still seeing a big difference and want to go back to square one. The second time you do it, you test it, it should be a lot closer. If not, then you've applied a bad correction. <coughs> so correcting existing raw data files and the read parameters in the editor, when you bring your raw data in to process it, you can, you can add a latency correction at that time. You're updating the latency value you used during the data collection by changing the value in the, in the single beam method. Then an SBMAX64 editor, you can enter the latency in the navigation field on the device offsets page. So the previous one was for the 32 bit editor. This is for the uh, single max 64 and device offsets. So 
Bach synchronization. Synchronize if you have a multi beam that outputs uh, datagrams with UTC timestamps. Synchronize if you plan to use post process heave. Synchronize if you plan to use post process GPS positions. And synchronize if you were using LiDAR data. The sync clock function requires that computer be exposed to changes from other programs. So in Windows, the user account control um, notification um, should be disabled to allow the software to update the computer time. That's a user control that Windows has in there and you have to set it down so it doesn't interfere with the time correction to sync the clock. If it's not disabled, uh, the bare time clock will still function. However, the computer time will not be changed. The bare time clock is how we use timing in HiPad. It's in the background. It's something you, you, you can't change or control or do anything about. But it's it's how we calculate and calibrate the timing. And for us to be able to do that, we have to go into the user account controls and disable them. So how clock synchronization works. Uh, GPS has timing, UTC time from the GPS is received using the one hertz ZDA message and uh, additional PPS signal. So Again, the ZDA has to be set to one hertz, and that's because the PPS is the, the one PPS, that's one pulse per second. Those have to be timed the same for it to be able to synchronize correctly. So one hertz is one PPS, one and the same. And using the GPS time, the, the clock monitored and the updates every second. The, the current time is pushed to Windows to update the Windows computer time. So that's how our very time time synchronization works. So the ZDA message from the GPS gets adjusted by the bare time clock model in HiPack, and that difference is recorded. And then for the timing for the echo sounder, it's using the uh, bare time model's time tag, which is derived from the GDA message from the GPS. So this is the PPS box that we were talking about earlier. In this case, the external box. And this is this is the HiPEC uh, PPS box here, and that's that one pulse per second that it's accurately, consistently putting out and calculating the timing a lot more accurately than your computer is. So time synchronization tests. Uh, make sure to monitor the difference between bare uh, time and GPS clocks. The difference should be small, uh, less than uh, 20 milliseconds. Should work its way towards 0.0 uh, uh, milliseconds after a spike. If it gets large and stay large, something is wrong. Stop surveying, stop recording the data, and, and figure out where the timing is going wrong. So select one GPS device to use to synchronize the computer clock to UTC in the HiPAC configuration page. So this is back to the, the hardware. 
and you you go to GPS setup. And for synchronization, choose that PPS box if you're using. What's that graph synchronization that is? Is that? So it puts a graph in the GPS DLL window. Oh, okay. You can actually see it. So this is just in your GPS setup specifying if you're using a PPS box. And always display the synchronization to the graph. So uh, test the consistency of your ZDA message for synchronization. It's located under Utilities, Calibration menu. This graph shows uh, sync error in milliseconds. Sync error equals the difference between the bearer time and the time arrival of the ZDA message. So it's showing that, that latency and correction. All right, uh, device interfaces. HiPAC here says over 300. There's even there's even more than that. There's 221 in the, for HiPAC 2019 in the devices folder. Another 150 in the devices custom folder. In addition, high sweep, another 70 devices built in. Constantly modifying and maintaining them and providing updates. These are the DLLs that Jerry had talked about earlier. These are for any any device to work in HiPAC needs a driver, a DLL, and so this shows how many devices that we have set up to work with so far. So you copy the DLL to the HiPAC 2019 devices folder, or whichever version you're working in, and then you go into hardware and you can click rescan uh, driver list to rescan the file saved on your <coughs> high pack folder. Um, once you bring it into the folder, then you just click rescan in the hardware here for them to come up. So there's new devices if you're using an older version and you want to, we have, uh, you're using 2018 and then you want to use devices that are now available in in 2020, you would take them from the newer program, save them in your HiPAC uh, devices folder, and then rescan the driver list, and then those would populate in your hardware configuration. So the GPS NEMA, it's used to process NEMA sentences from most GPS systems. So these are just some of the different device drivers we have. Ntrip DLL, um, designed to pass Ntrip corrections to the GPS. Sh shares the same serial port as the GPS DLL. This is a YSI environmental sensor. So each of these you know, four or 500 drivers that we have they, they all work differently. They're all tailored to specific devices that you're using and used to configure all those different devices. And it's the device is putting out a certain message and IPAC's trying to take that message and put that data on your screen. And it's just the communication. It's, the, it's getting them to speak the same language. It's, it's saying, look for this speed and, and this type of signal um, and this type of data coming out of the device so HiPAC knows how to display it. So high sweep playback driver is used in conjunction with the high sweep survey program to allow HSX files to be replayed uh, by high sweep survey program in the correct location. So this is just, this is replaying your survey that you just gone out and collected. Um, you bring your raw files in, you have the HSX files, and it's, re, it's replaying that. So you, you could come back and 
show your whole data survey uh, to, to your boss, show them what you went out and did. So the use of this driver allows the data to be replayed as it was collected and used primarily, primarily in testing and training of new users. So you could go back and show you have a new guy coming in the office or gal coming in the office to work and do some surveying. It's a lot easier to set them down and show them an old, a survey that you've already done and they can see, see what it look, looks like and ask some questions before you get out in the field. Sontec M9, once again another device. Showing here about uh, do not check use for matrix and hardware options area. Uh, select use for matrix update in the setup dialog box of the device. That's specific for the, the M9 though. Anyone have a sonar that's difficult to use? Or not that your sonar is difficult to use. Sorry, that was a bad, bad way of saying it. I only have a sonar that you have configuration problems with or hardware setup problems with. You all you have your hardware set up good and you're all working great and this was just a way to pass time, right? <laughs> Sitting in the room today. All right. The reason I asked the question is we're going through here and, and I realize as Josh is talking, he, there's a lot of slides that just reiterate how to set up different hardware. Anyone in here use an M9? Do you know what an M9 is? Sontec is a, so, a Xylem company makes an M9. It's a river quality thing. It does the velocities and they have one that you can use for hydro surveyor that, or river sur hydro surveyor I think. I don't know. River surveyor, hydro surveyor. One of them does bathymetry with a bunch of different soundings. So there's a lot of different devices you can set up. Who's got a problem with hardware? Anyone have a problem with hardware? Something that fails, that crashes, you lose your hardware, something that's going wrong, something that affects you that we can fix. The reason I bring that up, we can go to the next slide, we don't care about this slide. Um, AIS, anyone ever seen an AIS system? Anyone use one? You can bring it up at high pack, and yeah, we've got a couple on your dredges. We can put them on there, and, and when you're sitting there looking at it, you get these little pointy triangle things that look like a 1980s video game. They show you where all the ships are around you. It's just a deal all that's out there. It's one of the interfaces. The reason we put these slides together was to show you guys some of the different interfaces that are out there. Um, you can see the positions of them. And the reason I stood up again is because I finally had something to drink and I'm not hacking and coughing again. So it shows you the different stuff with the AIS stuff. This portion of the sessions we put together to get you guys familiar with any problems with hardware. It's important to understand about the archives that we talked about and to talk about you know, some of the things that go on in the IPAC hardware program. Anyone have a question about hardware? Because we're going to go through another 10 slides of different interfaces that we could talk about. Or we can just say you guys are bored enough listening to the slides that I put together about different pieces of hardware and talk about what you guys care about. Anyone pick this session for a specific reason? Is it because you don't do multi beam. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I heard about in the uh, sensor class earlier, and they had a way to bring in castaway uh, sound velocity data automatically. Yes, in the castaway, you can, there's a button in the castaway mm -hmm. that you can import it to IPAC, and if you're in the multi beam, you can accept it that way. But I don't know that we have that for the single beam. I'll have to ask. That's how you answer a question. You're not sure of the answer. And you know why I look stupid in front of all these people? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't know if we've done it for single beam. But for the multi beam, what he's talking about is a sound velocity. Anyone do sound velocity probes? The castaway is really cool. I was recently given training to somebody and they pulled a fishing pole out. They hooked a castaway up to it and tossed it in the water with a fishing pole. And I was telling the Sontech guys about it, and they said, oh, yeah, we had a customer who did that, too, and they broke the fishing pole and lost the castaway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> but I thought it was cool. They could just do it with a fishing pole, because I was used to the old ones where you had to drop it and then pull all that wet line up in your hands, and it sucked. Um, yeah, so the castaway, 
it has a button on there, it's pre-programmed within HiPAC, it outputs our format and we can bring it right in. We're getting that way with a lot of stuff where we're trying to simplify this stuff. How many people have been using HiPAC for a long time? We're off topic now, basically, we're done with showing them slide after slide after slide. We're going to make this an interactive session now. How many people have been using it a long time, I asked. I didn't pay attention. How many people are new to it? Okay, of you new people, how many people have used other software or have ever surveyed on the water in the past? Okay, so one of the things that HiPAC's trying to do, and I'm telling you this, so you can take it, this is what we're doing. Try to make the software simpler, right? Hydrographic survey software's got a lot of things you gotta understand and know, and there's a lot of buttons, and you have to know where those buttons are. And you gotta know why you need to use those buttons, and that's what these sessions are about. So what I would ask you, because we're here for you guys. Write down any notes about, hey, I was in the hardware session and I didn't understand this. Or I was in this session and I think this would be better. Or I use your software all the time and it sucks. I work in tech support. What do you think people call me up and say? <laughs> they don't ever call me up and say, you know what, I'm out here on a boat freezing my ass off and I'm having a great time with iPad. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that. They call me up and they say, my sonar doesn't work. HiPAC won't start, and I'm freezing, and it's raining, and I left my key in Texas. Those are the kinds of questions we get. So, I feel your pain. I spend a lot of time in the field. Josh goes in the field. Jose's in the back here. He's going to be going in the field. He's one of our tech support guys. Um, when we're in the field, we're just like you guys. We're out there, and then it's really embarrassing to be on site with you, and all of a sudden it crashed. And you're like, turn to me and say, why did it crash? And, well, I've been with the company 22 years and I cannot tell you why that <laughs> crashed. You know, there's a lot of things that go on, like Garrett was saying in the opening session, do you have the latest Windows driver in there? Did Windows decide it was time to defrag your hard drive, which used to happen periodically on older computers? They would defrag themselves. Anyone know what defragging a hard drive is? And it's not blowing it up. It goes in and takes all the little bits that are out of place and lines them all back up so that when you're looking for that Word document, all the bits are in one spot instead of all over the hard drive. It would take overnight to defrag a hard drive. Well, sometimes Windows would have that on schedule and it notoriously would happen in the middle of your survey. That all of a sudden it started to defrag the hard drive and then the plan line information that used to be in this spot on the hard drive isn't there. And it would crash. So there's a lot of different things that can go wrong in your survey. And there's a lot of different things that can go wrong within HiPAC. We're here to help you. <coughs> 